May I have a mic check from you, Dr. Yes, Hanford? one, two, three, four, five. Testing, one, two, three, four, five. Testing one, two, three, four, five. I'm okay. How's that now? Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is the importance of African American history at the 21st century. And we have with us to talk about the importance of the African American history experience at the 21st century, uh, Dr. E.K. Sanford uh, from uh, Tennessee State University. And of course, Dr. Sanford, let me welcome you to the show this morning. And I know that uh, you're no stranger yes. to any members of uh, our audience. You've been us, with us on a number of occasions. And I, I'm glad to uh, have you here today to talk about the significance of the African-American history experience 
at the 21st century. And so let's start off by having you to give us some information about your background, your education, and some of the things that were important in terms of leading you, leading you to us this morning, and then we'll talk about other things. Okay, well, thank you very much, and it's always a pleasure to be here. Again, I'm E. Kelly Sanford. I'm a professor of sociology at Tennessee State University, and I did my doctorate degree at Howard University in Washington, D.C., as well as a postdoc at Penn State University. One of my positions that I've held in the past that I think is very significant and related to today's topic is being Director of Africana Studies at the University of Montana in Missoula, Montana, where there was a very strong aim at that university as one of its missions to understand the importance of African American and other minority groups' history. So I think that is something in my particular past that makes it relevant for me to be here today. But in addition to that, I would like to say in reference to that, I have a specialization in looking at um, the African American experience, the history of it, understanding certain social issues and problems related to racism, minority group problems, health and wellness, and disparities that might lead to high crime rates within the American society in which we live. So I think this whole idea of what we're talking about today, the significance of African American history is very important because it is indeed something that we all should share in and understand from an earlier age to the present as well as in the future. You know, as a matter of fact, this is the uh, beginning of the African American history experience known as the uh, African American History Month. And yes. you might uh, say a word or two in reference to the African American History yes. Month, uh, uh, Doc Dr. Sanford, okay. and then we'll get into uh, why uh, African American history is important. Mm -hmm. But let's okay. start off by having you to say something about okay. Okay. why this month of February is important. Okay, and I would like to try to um, give significant credit to Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Mm -hmm. He was the one that really invented the importance of having African American history, and it was a day, having African American history today. And, um, and Dr. Carla G. Woodson felt very strongly that it was important at that particular time to then um, have something that would give everyone within the society and culture in which we live in some idea about the contributions that African Americans have made from slavery to freedom. And then, of course, it turned into African American History Week and that went on for the longest time, and now indeed is African American History Month. And in many institutions of higher education, many other industries, economic business, they will give actually some significance and time to, to talk about the contributions of African Americans uh, this particular month. And so it's very significant and important to do that. And it's, it's a welcoming thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping today we can get into how it is still relevant and important or significant today mm -hmm. as it was a long time ago um, when the miseducation of the Negro was um, written um, many, many years ago and how the importance of having African American history um, month, week, day is important and even throughout the year because it helps us to have a pretty good understanding about ourselves, the culture, and for other groups to have a significant understanding of that population as well. As a matter of fact, I think as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Carter G. Woodson believed yeah. that unless we had an, uh, 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 the understanding of all uh, ethnic groups within yeah. the United States, we really wouldn't have a, a, a good understanding of what America is all about. Yeah, and I think that uh, the ability to sort of carve out Mm -hmm. In this particular month, it's not to say that uh, uh, African Americans are more important than any other ethnic mm -hmm. group, and et cetera, and et cetera, but I think it does give us an opportunity to highlight, yes. as you've indicated, uh, the African American experience in uh, the United States. Yes. And, uh, and I think, as you indicated earlier, from slavery yes. to freedom. Yes. See, we were the only uh, group that uh, were slaves in yes, a real right. sense in America. And so yeah, I think so. that our story is especially good. And so what we'll do, we'll take our first commercial break, and then we'll come back and we'll allow you to uh, talk about the importance of the African American history experience. And we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break.
I see they're building the uh, African American history oh, structure down in right. on Jefferson, oh, on, yeah. on Eighth and Jefferson. Yes. Right yeah, it's it, yeah. Right, it's going to be quite a, a, a large building. It really I'm is. Impressed by yeah. what I see the structure of yeah. it going up. Yeah. So yeah, it's. Okay. <laughs> Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. E.K. Sanford, a professor at uh, Tennessee State University, and he's given us some information in, uh, in reference to the significance of the African American history experience. Uh, doctor, let's see if we can pick up and uh, give you an opportunity over the next eight minutes okay. simply to talk about some of the things that, uh, in a real sense, you teach yes. daily uh, at uh, Tennessee State University, some of the okay. uh, sociological information that our audience might not be familiar with. Okay. Well, thanks so much again. And I, and I say that in reference to African American History Month and the significance of it. We can be thinking about any social issue or concern that might be quite relevant within the society in which we live in, within the culture. And Dr. E.B. Taylor defined culture as that complex whole that entitled or encompass customs and traits and anything that could be passed down from one generation to the next generation to the present. So when we think in terms of the importance of African American history, it is quite significant to understand the past, 244 years of enslavement and how did that impact the culture of a particular population, as it did Native Americans and other ethnic groups that migrated to the United States. But as was said in the first segment, something unique was about the African and African American experience here in America that enslavement took place for that time. So if we understand in the context of culture, one can see how something that's supposed to be passed down from one generation to the next generation was destroyed in any positive way. And that was strategically done in an effort to kind of control a group of people to enslave them. And there's much literature out there that one can um, bring up and discuss uh, and, and, and then look at that. And, and I think one of the significant reasons we have African American History Month or a day or a week how it should be a very much a part of the educational curriculum mm -hmm. so that people can have a focus or idea about that legacy mm -hmm. of that culture that was passed down or not in a fair way passed down from one generation to the next generation that could lead into certain thoughts about policies in the present. Mm -hmm. For instance, on many of our shows, we have talked about the significant amount of, of crime that exists in America. Mm -hmm. We have, for instance, 6.5% of African American males that make up the entire population, but 40.2% are actually in prison. Incarcerated. They're incarcerated. Mm -hmm. So when we look back at um, Dr. Charcy McIntyre's classic book in, entitled Criminizing a Race, mm -hmm. she looked at it from slavery as coming out of slavery into reconstruction and how people were re-entered into the prison system. Mm -hmm. And now we have the industrial prison complex where even today 40.2 percent of African American males are in prison while they only make up about 6.5 percent of the entire American population. Mm -hmm. So we can see these disparities, Good. but we have to systematically understand how they were connected to the past. That's why it is important to understand um, African American history and kind of connect it to what has happened or not happened mm -hmm. fairly over a particular time period. So when we look at social structure, all of the institutions that make up the society, we can connect back early and see how there were a lot of dysfunctions for this segment of the population that was supposed to be passed down from one generation to the next generation, but it was all unfair. Mm -hmm. So when we look at disparities and statistics today or, or social problems and issues that confront us with that particular ethnic group, you can see why if we can understand how it's connected to what happened in the past to the very present. And that's not to say that a lot of positive things have not improved. With, with the advent of moving out of Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, that was a law of the land to keep things segregated, separate but, mm -hmm. separate but equal, mm -hmm. that moved into 1954, given that we are talking about African American History Month with um, Thurgood Marshall, who that became the Supreme Court Justice, mm -hmm. that helped fight that and to overturn the Plessy case because it was inherently biased and unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. 
and that helped people move forward in a very positive way. However, given the legacy, it also caused a lot of inequity within families who would not have had education, that could not have socialized the next generation in the same way that the dominant group could. So there was a, a infiltration from the 50s to the 60s as the civil rights movement took place, to the 70s with the Black Power movement, the Black Panther movement, to the 80s and with affirmative action. And now you have the millennials born in the 90s who might have this sense that they don't have any connection to what happened in the past or what's going on right now. And that is very relevant and important for groups of people to know the history, as well as the dominant group. And everyone who's improving, going into law, becoming a congressman or a senator, or even a president to understand that interconnectedness. Because it's in that connecting those dots of what happened to the past to the present that gives us some understanding of what's going on right now in the present. As a matter of fact, uh, I, as, as you made those statements, I was thinking that that's essentially what uh, Dr. Woodson uh, yes, was it. talking about, Carter G. Woodson was yes. talking about. That is, unless we understand and we see the situation of Africans within yeah. the context of the American experience, then we really don't understand what America is all about. Mm, and, I, and I think that I, I like that statement, yes. those statements there. Yes. And, and, and just go on and develop it as, okay. as you so desire. Okay, and, and that's so true, but it's important n not only for all ethnic groups, because mm -hmm. when we talk about African American history, we're talking about a fairness within curriculum. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that I'd actually worked on as a movement mm -hmm. in diversity in higher education. Mm -hmm. And that became institutionalized throughout America that with the hopes that in elementary, junior high, high school, mm -hmm. and curriculums in higher education would move toward much more information related to diversity. Mm -hmm. Um, among all ethnic groups. I teach a class that's called Minority Group Problems, mm -hmm. where we can have a pretty good understanding of every minority group and what are some of the systematic injustices that might occur within the society that might prevent fairness. Mm -hmm. And some of this might be related to illness, mm -hmm. health and wellness, such as obesity rates mm -hmm. or heart attacks or high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Some of those things can come from the invisible nature mm -hmm. of um, oppression. And, and cause depression and stress that might cause one ethnic group to unfairly have to experience it in comparison to another. We even look at social class differences, how you can have some who are in the, in the upper class and um, to, the, to the upper middle class across all ethnic groups that might have the systems that are present in society in a much fairer way might have better health and wellness, mm -hmm. while those in the lower class and in poverty might be born into a particular situation that would influence certain behaviors, mm -hmm. and that behavior might lead, lead to high crime rates, you know, um, overweight and obesity, mm -hmm. and, and deaths. Very good. And, and so what we'll do, Doctor, we'll take our second commercial break, and we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. What do you want to talk about this then? Okay, well, we'll try to bring in some clothes. This is the last segment, right? Yeah, uh, so I talk about it in general, play a little historical context, bring up this is African American history month, uh, some people that will contribute to African American history. Okay. They kind of lead it into um, um, some solutions and what yeah. we have to do, that yeah. type of okay. thing. Okay, very good. Uh-huh. Ready when you are. We're ready. <clears throat> Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. E.K. Sanford from uh, Tennessee State University, and he's given us some information in reference to the significance of the African-American experience in American history. And I think, Doctor, you've already given us a good overview yes. in terms of uh, the experience, some of the experiences of the uh, African-American in American history. And I think that uh, one of the things that, that you talked about has to do with the institution of slavery. Yes. And as long as we understand 
uh, get a better understanding, we can understand some of the issues that Africans have to uh, face and how we have been able to, what, overcome a number of things. Let's pick up yeah. uh, where you would like to okay. go in this last segment. All right, and I would like to try to suggest that there's a reoccurring pattern, I feel, mm -hmm. um, of those millennials that are born into the 90s uh, mm -hmm. up to the present and, 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 and coming forth. The parents have to be vigilant mm -hmm. and understand that they need to try to help this generation and those to follow of the importance of understanding the history mm -hmm. and the backdrop, if you will, of not only all ethnic groups, but African Americans in particular. And not only African Americans, but every group of people that live in America, even that come here, that should be something that is very significant mm -hmm. for them to understand because we were such a, 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 a part of the very fabric of mm -hmm. the development of the American society. And we are the only ones that have yes. been described as a peculiar uh, people. That's you right. You see, and that's slavery right. made that that's for right. us. Nobody else no had to undergo some yeah, slavery. Yeah, that's right. And, and so, since you brought that up, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kenneth Stamp mm -hmm. has his excellent book that was entitled title, The Peculiar the Institution. institution. Uh -huh. And um, in that piece, he talks about that whole idea of, of grabbing a group of people by the millions and bringing them and stripping them of their culture. Mm -hmm. And that's why I brought that definition of it up earlier. Mm -hmm. Because when you take away the culture, you're taking away the very core mm -hmm. of a group of people. Mm -hmm. But to control a group, that's what you would want to do. Mm -hmm. So this, this is still out there, and it's important for people to know it. Not only that group mm -hmm. that uh, millennials need to be refreshed on, but the dominant group needs to know it too. Mm -hmm. And only so you can have a decent conversation mm -hmm. about the very fabric mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Now, if we think in terms of Alex de Tocqueville, mm -hmm. he had a classic piece that was entitled Democracy in America. Mm -hmm. And he was a French philosopher, and when he came to America, he would thought that, hey, America had this great penal or prison system, mm -hmm. and it was highly advanced in comparison to the, quote, old world at that mm -hmm. time, France. But as he came to this country and was driving in, down in his horse and buggy and looked out the window, he mm -hmm. saw people of African descent mm -hmm. that were enslaved, in shackles, and working. And when he saw that and thought about the, oh my gosh, they have been here for hundreds of years mm -hmm. and there is still there, mm -hmm. he reached in that classic piece that we would never reach a true democracy mm -hmm. because of how it was founded mm -hmm. on slavery. Mm -hmm. So when we look at some of the repercussions based on his philosophy and theoretical framework, we can see a lot of the inequalities that still exist today. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to understand African American history within the context of the American society so everyone mm -hmm. can have an inclusive way of understanding social problems and issues mm -hmm. and try to find solutions to them. Mm -hmm. If not, then we will indeed continue the same process of racism, prejudice, and discrimination one segment of the of, of population feeling that they are dominant over another one, mm -hmm. things in commercial showing inadequate type of, of, of fairness in, in, in actions and, and, and inclusiveness. So this was important coming out of um, the great W.B. Du Bois when he said in the 19th century that the problem would be mm -hmm. that other color line. Mm -hmm. And we saw it in the 20th century. Now we're in the 21st century and the color line is still a problem. Mm -hmm. Now when we link that to social class, mm -hmm. we might find some, people might say, well look, you had an a African American president mm -hmm. and there are people in Congress and there are people that are doing well, mm -hmm. even us, professors that are institution of higher education, mm -hmm. but still I'm going back to the statistic that I started with. Mm -hmm. We make up about 6.5% of the population, about 40.2 are incarcerated. There's still a problem. When we see the reoccurring pattern of, pre of police brutality and shootings because of the subliminal nature of how they look at a, a, sort of a suspect and think that they are um, something that needs to be shot and killed mm -hmm. versus just taken in. Mm -hmm. um, these are things that we have to be able to understand the history and how did those thoughts and patterns mm -hmm. subliminally get in our mindset mm -hmm. about that. This the, is especially yes. true when you start talking about uh, young African Americans, yes. you know, the young African American yeah. youth. Yes. Uh, who face a real problem in terms of simply assimilating and being able to deal with some of the issues yeah. that many of us might have moved beyond. Yeah. Not that we solve them, yeah. but we've moved beyond, but they yeah. now face them. Uh, yes. uh, the uh, whole idea of uh, 
black lives make oh, uh, yeah. important mm -hmm. and black life and all of those things. Yeah. We've seen that yeah. and we've experienced that, but it might have been under a different name. Yes. And so the name might have changed, That's right. but the attitudes that many people have in reference yes. to the African American, especially the African American youth, yes. these things are still present in spite of uh, what we might call it. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's absolutely right. And these are the indicators that some of that racism and prejudice and discrimination mm -hmm. still exists mm -hmm. for a youth group to come up like Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. like you mentioned, or other groups mm -hmm. that have emerged to try to solve some of the problems. Mm -hmm. um, I have a feeling, though, that we have a, even a, a deeper problem with a majority of people not being conscious mm -hmm. that some of the ills are still there. Mm -hmm. Again, that's why African American History Month is, and, 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 the, and the history of African Americans mm -hmm. is so important to be in the curriculum mm -hmm. so people can understand that there is that importance that is there. Mm -hmm. And this can be done in literature class. If we're understanding African American literature in 1746 to 1865 mm -hmm. of the slave narrative, mm -hmm. very important information is there Good. in that context of that time. Mm -hmm. And then from 1865 to 1919, looking at the Reconstruction era, mm -hmm. let's talk about just literature that is present and out there. Then from 1919 to 1940 of the Harlem Renaissance period, very important information to know about those that contributed to scholarship mm -hmm. and to letters, meaning literature. Mm -hmm. um, right now, with fences out there that will fall into um, August Wilson and, and the mm -hmm. great literary pieces that he wrote. And now it was on stage and now in film. So mm -hmm. those are, are, are pieces that our younger people need to be familiar with, mm -hmm. but understand that contributions were made. Mm -hmm even before slavery was over, mm -hmm. um, of the slave narrative, that people wrote about their mm -hmm. experiences so that we could read about it and understand what was mm -hmm. going on during that time period. Mm -hmm. That led up to the whole civil rights movement of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, um, Thurgood Marshall, of course the great Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois that wrote The Souls of Black Folks mm -hmm. in 1903. Mm -hmm. Can't leave out Adam Clayton Powell and that whole movement, mm -hmm. Andrew Young. Mm -hmm. um, even um, Charles H. Wesley, the great historian mm -hmm. that, that wrote about the history of the African American experience. Mm -hmm. These are people that have contributed to the social change that we still are able to thrive, made changes mm -hmm. for the betterment of others, but we have to know that history of them mm -hmm. so that we can continue to move onward and mm -hmm. upward. You know, Dr. Sanford, uh, I think that uh, the information that you're given now is essentially the information that the two of us especially yes. is familiar with. I mean, yes. we know all about this, but so many of our young people. Yes. Uh, and, and I think that there's been a, a movement on the part of many people to uh, think about uh, perhaps avoiding or omitting mm -hmm. this aspect of the African experience. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, when you talk about the institution of slavery, mm -hmm. you've already indicated that we were there for more than 200 years. Yes. But in some of our textbooks, we don't even find that, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. And I think the things that we're talking about today is important from the uh, point of view of if people don't understand yes. some of these things, then they really don't understand what America is all about. Do you, yeah. That's my point of view. Th that's, it. To, that's it. And I'm thinking to, to develop solutions for mm -hmm. problems that we have, mm -hmm. we have to do it with that theoretical framework of understanding the past. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the great social scientists have indicated that. Um, great C. Wright Mills and understanding the sociological imagination said we have to understand the past. We have to understand the biography of not only of the individual but of the country in order to see how things need to be corrected today. So, yes, that's important and we have to come up with a few recommendations, being inclusive with education from um, in family development from birth to age two, from two to the first grade mm -hmm. through elementary, junior high, high school, if the curriculum was inclusive, if, um, if, if fair and support was given to an inclusive educational system so everybody could understand everyone else's culture and history. Very good, and of course, Dr. Stanford, let me uh, thank you for bringing that excellent information by. And I think that the more you talk about some of these things, I think the more our uh, audience is familiar with that. And so we'll be, uh, let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week to another informative edition of Comments. Thank you and good morning.
Yeah. <laughs> and put this right here. That'll work. That'll work. And then we'll put that here. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And then try to hide it that way. Okay. Okay. And I'll be sure to check. And Heather should be out there now. Mm hmm. Well, Doctor, you've been doing all right, huh? Yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, You're eight, Thank you. nine, ten. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> and you're good. All right. Never mind. One more, Dr. Haynes, please. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. Now is the time. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. How is that? The, yeah. okay. Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is the change in face of the African-American church at the 21st century. And we have with us as our guest this morning, Dr. Lewis Baldwin to mm -hmm. talk about uh, how the African-American church has changed mm -hmm. over the uh, last uh, century. And of course, Dr. Baldwin, let me welcome you to the show this morning. Thank you. Thank and you. to uh, tell you how delighted we are to have you but uh, as I say each time that uh, <laughs> you've been with us so many times yeah, and yeah. to talk about your background, your education yeah, and your experience, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sure that all of our members of our audience understand who you are and yeah. the many, many, many books <laughs> that you've written and, the, and your yeah. scholarship and et cetera. But for the sake of the audience, the sake of those few who might not know you, Let's have you to give us some information in reference to your background, your mm -hmm. education, and some of your experiences, and then we'll uh, get into the change in face of the, of the African American church at the 21st century. Let's all do it from that perspective. All right, thank you so much uh, for inviting me here first, and it's great to be here in uh, during Black History Month. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, I grew up in uh, Wilcox County, Alabama, Camden, Alabama, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, deep roots in the African-American church, particularly Southern Black Baptist Protestantism. Mm -hmm. uh, I matriculated at the public schools in uh, Camden, Alabama in the 1950s and 
uh, graduated from Camden High School in 1967. And of course, from there, I matriculated at Talladega College in Alabama, was there four years, uh, ultimately receiving a BA in history from Talladega. From there to Crozer Theological Seminary in Rochester, New York, where I received the MA in 1973 and the MD of Master of Divinity in 1975. And from there to Northwestern University, uh, where I was awarded the Ph.D. in American Religion in 1980. Uh, so my educational pilgrimage has really occurred uh, very much in connection with the black church. Uh, both are inseparable as far as I'm concerned, as far as I'm concerned in terms of my uh, own development. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, you, uh, <coughs> did you at one time said that your father was involved in uh, preaching. Is, is, did you tell us that? Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah. My uh -huh. father was a pastor in uh, uh, Wilcox uh, County, Alabama, or Butler County, Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, he also felt that his ministry related very much to civil rights. Mm -hmm. So he was a force in the black church in Alabama. Very good. And so let's, let's talk about <coughs> the uh, African-American church, uh, Dr. Baldwin, and to uh, sort of start us off at the uh, period of slavery. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about uh, the African-American church and et cetera, but yeah. uh, in, uh, during slavery, uh, Africans did not have an organized exactly. institution as a church. But nevertheless, they did have, speak to it from that perspective. Exactly, in the South particularly. Now, you did have in the, in the antebellum North, mm -hmm. Uh, the development of institutional black churches. Mm -hmm. But in the South, we had essentially the invisible institution of the slaves, mm -hmm. where they met in the woods and the thickets and the ravines mm -hmm. uh, to worship their God and to give expression to their spirituality. Uh, so you had in the South the invisible institution and in the North, mm -hmm. the more visible institutions in terms of the institutional church. But uh, in the pre-Civil War years, we know that black religion developed along both lines. But after the Civil War, you get, with, with the Emancipation Proclamation, you get uh, the freedom of African Americans in the South, and then institutional church developments began to occur throughout the country. So since the period of Reconstruction, I think we can speak of the black church as a national phenomenon. Uh, spilling over into the North and the South. And, and that, uh, that institution, of course, has taken on structural form and, and, and also a sense of mission mm -hmm. uh, since the uh, Reconstruction period. Mm -hmm. and, and so the African-American church that we're going to talk about today has changed has a changed face yes, yes. in the 21st century. Why don't you... Uh, and, and, and I guess we're getting ready for our second commercial break. Mm -hmm. But when we come back, what I'd like for you to do is to uh, look at the face mm -hmm. uh, of the uh, African-American church uh, before it changed. Yeah. And, oh. and, to, and use this eight-minute segment mm -hmm. to talk about that church. And okay. then after uh, the second commercial break, to talk about the second okay. African-American church okay. using all of the scholarship and individuals mm -hmm. and et cetera okay. within the framework of both of those churches. Okay. And so okay. we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. and how scholars today they, are viewing the and church. And we'll do yeah. that during the last 10 minutes. Oh, okay. And mm -hmm. so that'll give you an opportunity to use names, mm -hmm. uh, associate some names and activities and et cetera Books with, and with that yeah. area. And then after this second break, then we'll come back and okay. we'll deal with that last part, with the last 10 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. You ready? Yes, ma'am. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the uh, show for the morning. The uh, topic is the changing face of the African American church in the 21st century. And the uh, guest is Dr. Lewis Baldwin. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Baldwin, let us uh, see if we can pick up at this point mm -hmm. and to talk about the African American church uh, before it changed okay. uh, during the uh, 21st century. 
Now, we know about that church largely through the scholarship of some of the pioneers like W.E.B. Du Bois and Carter Woodson, uh, Benjamin E. Mays and Joseph Nickerson and E. Franklin Frazier. Mm -hmm. Now, Du Bois published the first history of the Negro church in 1903. And it uh, used the tools of social sciences as to critique the black church. Du Bois looked at the black church as a social institution. And I think his scholarship had a great influence on those scholars who came after him. Uh, du Bois publishing the Negro Church in 1903. Carter Woodson comes along in 1921, publishes a book on the history of the Negro Church. And in 1933, uh, Benjamin Mays and Joseph Nicholson uh, published The Negro's Church, and in 1963, of course, E. Franklin Frazier published The Negro Church in America. And they all were concerned about how the black church functioned as a social institution. Yeah, good. That black people could go to these institutions to feel a sense of racial unity, uh, to feel a sense of their own personhood, to develop some sense of mission uh, in these churches, but the argument in that first, uh, among those first group of scholars in the 20th century was the black church, that the black church was essentially social. Uh, of course, Du Bois and, Carter, and, 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 and E. Franklin Frazier were sociologists. Mm -hmm. Carter Woodson was a historian. Um, e. Franklin Frazier was a sociologist. So we can understand that the stress at that time was on the black so, church uh, as a social, social institution, institution. Uh -huh. and how he had met the needs of black people. But there was that critique among these scholars mm -hmm. also that the black church had not done enough to address the social, economic, and political problems confronted mm -hmm. by blacks. Mm -hmm. So this scholarship occurred during that period of the traditional black church. Mm -hmm. We can talk about the new black church later. Mm -hmm. But the, the argument also uh, focused around this question of just how involved the church was in civil rights mm -hmm. activism. You take people like E. Franklin Frazier and W.B. Du Bois, Carter Woodson, uh, they felt that the church had had much to be desired mm -hmm. in terms of its activism, mm -hmm. that it was primarily responding to the religious needs of the people and not really responding appropriately to the social, economic, and, and politi political, political needs, needs mm -hmm. of the people. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was an argument during that time. And we know that the life of the black church in the first half of the century, and perhaps certainly in the first half of the mm -hmm. century, uh, of course, proved that because you had a kind of de-radicalization mm -hmm. of the black church in that period from 1890 up to 1955. And Dr. King, Martin Luther King Jr. came along in 1955 uh, with the involvement of the church in the Montgomery bus boycott. And of course, we noticed the, what? The radicalization and, of the black church. And the church. change in faces. Exactly. It's moving away from a social organization. Yes. Now it's more a political, it's becoming a political organization. Exactly. More of a political organization, more of an organization that is involved in and the total needs of the black community, particularly economic, social, political. Uh, and of course, uh, the civil rights movement had a great impact on the changing face of the black church. Mm -hmm. That was one point at which the face of the black church changed because Dr. King made the church relevant in the struggle for civil rights. Mm -hmm. uh, he drew on the prophetic tradition of the black church and applied that in his civil rights campaign. So, uh, that was very, very important in the mid-1950s. Uh, so we see a different church from that we recognized in the period from Reconstruction up to uh, 1955 when the Montgomery bus boycott mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so in a real sense, uh, the uh, church, while it changed, how did people react, did African Americans react uh, to uh, the change in face of this church? I think the African Americans uh, on the whole, particularly those who were church connected, uh -huh. reacted quite well because what Dr. King did uh, and others who were involved in his Southern Christian Leadership Conference in the 1950s and 60s, uh, they made Gandhi relevant because many of Gandhi's ideas 
uh, coincide very much with New Testament ideas mm -hmm. in the Sermon on the Mount. No, Love your enemies, mm -hmm. turn the other cheek. Uh, so Dr. King and others in the South in the black church had already been exposed to the New Testament mm -hmm. uh, teachings of Jesus. So that made them more receptive to the teachings of Mohandas mm -hmm. K. Gandhi. Mm -hmm. So I would say that African Americans responded well to this changing, changing face of the black church uh, from the mid-1950s up when mm -hmm. Dr. King uh, drew on the church as a kind of social and political platform, as a de facto platform for the civil rights movement. Black Americans responded quite mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Very good. And, and, and so in a real sense, Dr. Baldwin, that uh, the church, while it might not have been a political, economic, and social organization in, 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 in the first instance, it still had to deal with social, political, and economic no, issues. Problem, yes. And how did this church deal with social, uh, and for, for example, mm -hmm. during this period, lynching mm -hmm. might have been a very, very important consideration. The yes. KKK yes, and all exactly. other kinds of organizations. Exactly. How did this first church respond to? Uh, well, uh, it depends on who you read. If you read, for an example, Gerard S. Wilmore, who's mm -hmm. written a, a very important work on on, on African-American religion, religion, he argues that during the slavery period, mm -hmm. the black church was very radical with people like Nat Turner, then Mark Beasy and others. He argues that the period from 1890 to 1955 was a period of de-radicalization. Mm -hmm. So he makes that argument. But if you look at E. Franklin Frazier, he argues that the black church from the slave period up to the civil rights movement had a predominantly otherworldly uh, outlook uh -huh, uh -huh. and was not so much concerned about uh, the issues and concerns of this world. But the last statement in reference to that was that the black church might have responded yes. to how society that it was in would anticipate it responding to. In other words, they could not do political things primarily because the society that they were in did not allow I for think, political things. You know I, I, think, mean? I think that happened with mm -hmm. most churches. Uh, Gerard Wilmore argued that most churches up to 1955 were Booker Wright churches. Okay, well, hold it and, and hold that thought, and we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short commercial break. You know, I... Mm -hmm. oh, he talked the about the traditional, uh -huh. now the mega church, mm -hmm. the new black the church. The new black church and, mm -hmm. and how it responds. Exactly. To, uh, exactly. Yeah, I, I was thinking, you know, when uh, Nat Turner and others, as a matter of fact, after slavery, the African American church almost had to res uh, be Retreat. concerned er only uh -huh. in religion. Exactly. Because outside of that, you know, the Klan and all those other uh, radical groups that wish to what? hold the Negro down and exactly. of course any, the, anybody who started talking about and, anything about voting and whatever and, in a church. And the beat back the, advances in the South. That's right. Uh -huh. you know, so yeah. he, so I, that's why I say the King represented one mm -hmm. aspect of the changing of the black church mm -hmm. and the 21st century represents another. Another. Uh -huh. Very mm -hmm. good. Okay. Yes ma'am. Thank you and welcome back to the final segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. Lewis Baldwin and he's given us some information in reference to the change in face of the African American church in the 21st century. And Dr., uh, I think you've already indicated how uh, the church faced yeah. the uh, earlier century, uh, mm -hmm. immediately after slavery and et cetera. Yeah. But now this church in the 21st century yeah. is a different church and it has a different face. What made yeah. this church so much different? Let me begin by saying that uh, my view is that the slave church represented the radicalized black church. Mm -hmm. The church from 1890 to 1955, during Reconstruction up to the, mm -hmm. to the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, represented a kind of de-radicalized black mm -hmm. church. The Civil Rights Movement re-radicalized the black church. Mm -hmm. 
But since that particular time, the death of Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968 particularly, we've seen a, a different kind of developing trend uh, in the black church, and it has to do with the rise of mega churches mm -hmm. and super mega churches. Mm -hmm. You look at mega churches being 2,000 to 5,000 members, uh, five, maybe 7,000, but when you talk about super mega churches, you're talking about in the range of 25, 35,000 members. Mm -hmm. And we see now what scholars call a new black church. Mm -hmm. It's called the mega church, the super mega churches. Mm -hmm led by figures like T.D. Jakes and Creflo Dollar, uh, the late Eddie Long. Mm -hmm. uh, and these leaders are re really considered not only religious leaders, but entrepreneurs, yeah. because these churches, when you talk about the 25,000 uh, members to 35,000 yeah. members range, you're talking about, about some institutions. Large, that's right, you're talking about some large and, churches. Too. And, and scholars like Anthony Penn and... Uh, uh, Paula McGee and uh, others are uh, talking about this new black church phenomenon, which means that these mega churches are preaching uh, personal enrichment, a gospel of materialism that God wants you to have this, and if God wants you to have this, you're going to have it. Uh, it's a prosperity gospel. So that's what the new black church of the 21st century is all about. And when you look at T.D. Jakes and Creflo Dollar and others, they are actually uh, defining how we do church mm -hmm. in okay. the 21st mm -hmm. century because many preachers throughout the country in black churches are patterning, patterning their messages after Dollar and Jakes and others mm -hmm. uh, in these mega churches. Uh, they're beginning to uh, pattern their liturgical styles after these churches. Mm -hmm. And of course, their messages. Mm -hmm. They are messages of Christian uh, materialism. Mm -hmm. God wants you to have this. If you can believe it, you can yeah, achieve, achieve it. it. Mm -hmm. So this is what is happening with the new black church today. And Paula McGee has talked about that in a book that is forthcoming mm -hmm. on new theology. Mm -hmm. Uh, New Black Church Theology, and, and Anthony Penn at Rice University has written about that, and Sandra Barnes at, uh, uh, at uh, Vanderbilt University, mm -hmm. all writing about the emergence of this New Black Church phenomenon. And what they are saying is that the Black Church is being redefined. Mm -hmm. Redefined. You talk about the traditional Black Church, but when you talk about the Black Church of the 21st century, it's a New Black Church. Mm -hmm. It's being redefined in terms of its mission priorities, in terms of its identity, in terms of its mission outreach, mm -hmm. and at so many other levels. Social activism and, exactly. and all of those kind of things, exactly. I would imagine, that would play a significant role in, in the difference between. Now, this new black church does not have the same pressure, outside pressure, on it as the earlier face of the African-American church, which is to say that these new churches are not intimidated exactly. by racism or uh, clans or anything else, that they are basically free in reference to parts of, the, uh, of, of what they can do. Is exactly. that what you're saying? Uh, that's true in a sense, but uh, most of the scholarship argues that these, the new black church is less prophetic mm -hmm. than the church that existed during the era of Martin Luther King, Jr. Mm -hmm because Martin Luther King Jr. preached a social gospel mm -hmm. and made the church relevant to that gospel. Mm -hmm. He was concerned about how the gospel contributed uh, to a sense of social action, mm -hmm. uh, how it contributed to the creation of a particular ethical ideal. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we find in contemporary churches, the mega churches, the new black church, of course, is an emphasis on spiritual enrichment uh, personal salvation, mm -hmm. but not that prophetic dimension that Dr. Mm -hmm. King brought to the church. Mm -hmm. That's what's missing, I think, in this new black church, this mega church, the super mega churches mm -hmm. like uh, Potter's House in Dallas led by uh, Dr. T.D. Jakes. Mm -hmm. Dr. King was concerned about how the church should be, how the church could be a voice of conscience, mm -hmm. how it could be put to the service of bringing about social, economic, and political change mm -hmm. through demonstrations and marches and other forms of direct action, mm -hmm. nonviolent direct action. But you don't see that today uh -huh. mm -hmm. with the new black, black church, church, the uh -huh. mega church, uh -huh. and the super mega church. Uh -huh. 
And, 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 and so would you say that this new church is more a church of African-American nationalism, that is black nationalism, than perhaps the earlier church had been? I would say individualism uh, because okay. the earlier traditions in the black church encouraged a kind of communal consciousness, mm -hmm. a, a, the idea that the black community as a whole was one and that they had to struggle for the liberation of the black community. Mm -hmm. But today there's so much emphasis on individual salvation, mm -hmm. so much emphasis on personal enrichment, mm -hmm. uh, so much emphasis on how I might improve my own situation. Mm -hmm. But I think the church during Martin Luther King Jr. era uh, was put to the service of a, com of a communal revolution. Mm -hmm. Good. That is all people mm -hmm. had to benefit from the changes that occurred mm -hmm. in society. So you had the movement from the slave church, which was radicalized, mm -hmm. to the church between 1890 and 1955 that was de-radicalized, mm -hmm. from the church from 1955 to, to, to roughly 1968, mm -hmm. led by figures like Martin Luther King Jr., re-radicalized mm -hmm. in what we see uh, since the death of King in 1968, through the 70s, 80s, 90s, up to the present, of mm -hmm. course, is the rise of the mega church phenomenon, uh -huh. super mega churches, which are not very prophetic. Mm -hmm. uh, churches that are very important in black life, but are not, as, not in the sense that they were in the time of Martin Luther King Jr. These are the churches, for example, that will talk about the African-American economic situation within the church. Exactly. And by using the members of that particular church able to, in a real sense, uh, put forth Yes. Some of the economic do doctrines that uh, rent, uh, having uh, houses and uh, mm -hmm. other kinds of things that you wouldn't ordinarily think that a church would have. Exactly. But because they do have such a large membership, yeah. they can afford to become involved in renting cars and et cetera, exactly. et cetera. Is that what we're saying? And, and building, uh, build it, building uh, homes for the elderly uh, and, uh -huh. and that kind of thing. But what we see today, of course, with this new black church is, I think, a retreat from civil rights activism, mm -hmm. prophetic civil rights activism. Mm -hmm. And I think that, of course, is a serious problem. It is. Uh -huh. uh, and also what we see are uh, developing trends is that uh, young people are so alienated from the church mm -hmm. today. And I think uh, Sierra Lincoln and Lars Mamiya pointed that out in 1990 in a study on, mm -hmm. on black religion and the African-American churches. Mm -hmm. That is... For the first time in our history, we are seeing more African-American young people who not only do not know anything about uh, uh, the church, but they have no respect for the and, church. And don't attend And they church. don't attend the church. <laughs> uh -huh. So that is a developing trend uh -huh. in the 21st century also. And then you have the, the dying phenomenon of the neighborhood church. Mm -hmm. uh, churches are moving out of neighborhood into mm -hmm. other communities. And of course, that is another tr trend, I think, that is defining mm -hmm. the new black church of the 21st century. Very good. And of course, Dr. Baldwin, we are coming to the end of this show. And mm -hmm. I think that the information that you've given uh, sets up a good uh, contrast mm -hmm. between these uh, two churches. Okay. And uh, I think that our audience has some idea in terms of where they stand within these churches, you mm -hmm. know. And, and, and so I want to thank you for that. And mm -hmm. let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of comments. Thank you and good morning.